Right now, you can see I'm looking at the website itself. See, so it says log in. So I'm not currently logged in. So I'm going to try a search here for Rappahannock. I'm going to see what we find. Okay, so we find a couple of things. Uh, you know, a lot of these are in the subscription database. I mean, it's got 150, 160,000, while the, the 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 free database has 150 to 160,000. Subscription database has got like 200 times that or something like that. So we do have a link here to WorldCat, which can help you find information by or about ships. Uh, this can be a challenge at times, but it is something that, that can work. They've made a lot of changes with WorldCat, so they're a little bit harder <clears throat> to use these days. I'm going to log in now. Let's see. And then I'm going to give it a try again. And now you can see we're now logged in. We found 10 citations from seven different resources. And this is what you will find. You don't find, actually, a lot of resources will link to full text when we can, but very often also they won't. So it's important to know that. It's important to keep that um, in mind. So what you learn here is that a vessel named Rappahannock is mentioned in Ralph Snow's Bath Iron Works, the first hundred years, published by Maine Maritime Museum. I was actually working at Maine Maritime Museum when I identified the challenges of looking for information about specific ships, because if we wanted to learn something about the Sewell ships of steel, these not particularly famous vessels, but vessels about which has, stuff has been written, you had to go book by book in the library to see what you could find. And that library, actually, the, the collection was closed, so visitors couldn't really do that. And I thought, there's got to be a better way of making this uh, work. And so this is the end result. Page 16 of Snow's Bath Ironworks mentions Rappahannock. In Ira Glazer's and Michael Tepper's Famine Immigrants, there's a, a vessel named Rappahannock in Volume 1 at DM. And these mean different things. You know, basically, we're taking whatever information is available from the resource itself. So in these titles, there's no additional information about Rappahannock. If you look at this one from the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database online, there was a vessel named Rappahannock, Captain Clark, 220 tons, eight guns. And this one is a hot link, so we can follow a link to that and see where it takes us. And this takes us to a specific voyage of this particular Rappahannock with information that has been collected in slavevoyages.org. This directory is an incredible collection of resources that's trying to track the movement of of enslaved people in the through the well throughout ac across the Atlantic transatlantic specifically here's another entry from the Great Lakes vessel online this one it says it has an illustration let's see if that's true uh, I didn't check so we'll see okay it looks like in this case I I have to research I have to search again sometimes that happens sometimes it happens because the format has been redone or because you just can't set that up in advance. But I just repeated the search and here we find an image of Rappahannock and information about this particular vessel, 308 tons. And I think we'd seen some of that information. Well, we found a propeller 1895 with its official number. And then here's a couple of other Rappahannocks in uh, Mystic Seaport's ship register database and it takes us directly to that page uh it's a little bit tough to see here let's see if i can go in a little bit rappahannock captain russell and there's various information here in this particular case so this is a great example of all the different kinds of things that you find in the database this was an annual directory this one from 1865 okay and it just says it's like a phone book for ships basically that entry we saw about the uh, transit from the transatlantic slave trade was talking about a specific voyage of that particular vessel. Great Lakes Vessels Index online index was looking at a particular vessel with some information about it and its history. And other entries, such as this entry from Bunting's Sea Struck, mentions Rappahannock, that is a, a ship. And so, and is mentioned on page 226. Now, we don't know a whole lot about what it says on that page, but we know that it's worth, it may be worth finding and tracking down. And that's the most important thing to me. Like learning that 
this citation exists, that this mention exists, is so incredibly valuable and I think makes a big difference in making it possible for people to search for information. But we can see right now <clears throat> that we've got a couple different things. Now, <clears throat> in this case, so since this is this book is about it's a maritime history of sorts, we can guess, I would guess that when they say ship, they specifically mean a square rig vessel with three or more masts, where all three masts have got square rigs on them, including the third mast. If the third mast didn't have a, a main square rig, it would be called a bark. So they mean a, a ship in the in the sort of the definition, the maritime definition, rather than something that's bigger than a boat. So that's probably different from this one, which says it's a schooner, which has got four and a half masts, at least two four and a half masts. And see, we hear something, we see something here that's a propeller. This one, you know, from the transatlantic slave trade database is obviously a bit earlier. So we see what my point is that we see multiple vessels with the same name. And that can be a real challenge. And if you want to, you really want to see it, the, the worst is almost certainly Mary. You do a search for Mary and you find over 5,000 citations for ships with that name, which, yeah, that's that's pretty overwhelming. But we do have this thing that we have done. It takes a lot of work. But when we can, we connect specific citations for ships with a record that we have created for a particular ship. And my favorite for this is certainly the Monongahela. I love showing off the Monongahela. And so the friends in the Pacific Northwest, born and raised in Seattle, will particularly appreciate this. But I, in just a moment, I'll get to that. You can see here, we're looking at three different vessels. All of them, not only were they all called the Monongahela, but they were all called USS Monongahela. They were three separate naval vessels. And not to get too technical about it, but we're using wiki data identifiers here so that to bring these different citations together. We're trying to really be open, use some of the resources of the open web. So if you're doing something and you know that you've got a wiki, you've got a wiki data identifier for, for a particular ship, you can, you know what this URL will look like at, at ship index if we've got entries about it. It'll be shipindex.org slash vessels slash the Q identifier. But if you're not familiar with the Q identifier, you're not familiar with wiki data, that's absolutely fine. It's no problem at all. I just want to be clear that we're talking now, we're talking about a specific hull, basically. This specific ship named the Monongahela, this one, this replenishment oiler, which had the pennant number AO-178 when it was in the United States Navy, entered in 1981. It may still be in there. So here's a book by Paul Silverstone called The Navy of the Nuclear Age, 1947 to 2007. And it mentions the Monongahela on page 216. So now you know, oh, well, let's go track down Silverstone's book and see what we can find. And I wanna highlight here something that we've done here because we've done, in, whenever we can do this, we make corrections to the information that be, is being imported into the database. This was an entry from WorldCat that spelled out Monogahila. And we could see immediately that that was incorrect. So we've fixed it so that it shares the right name. But we also kept the old one just in case I was totally wrong about it. And it really was the Monokahila. And we want to go back and fix that. Or or you know more than I do. And you can, you can find it under, under that name as well. But of course, my favorite Monongahela uh, is this one. This Oh, actually, the Monongahela is not is not the USA one, but I'm going to show you a couple of some other information. We have a bunch of different citations from American Neptune. American Neptune was the, the primary journal of American maritime history published by the Peabody Essex Museum. And so you can see that in volume 20, page 141, there's an entry about this uh, vessel. I think, if I'm not mistaken, the Monongahela that I particularly am a fan of is this one. You'll see it mentions in the sea chest. The Journal of the Puget Sound Maritime Historical Society. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to limit it to those with images. So apparently this article in the U.S. Naval Institute Proceedings has an illustration. And this is obviously a U.S. naval vessel, but I didn't know which one. So that's why we didn't connect it with one of these specific holes up here. <clears throat> this was another one. This was Monongohila. 
And this image, which comes from the University of Washington, well, actually comes from the Puget Sound Maritime Historical Society, it was hosted by, by way of the University of Washington. It's this fantastic ship picture of the vessel being pulled out of Lake Union as the Aurora Bridge is nearing completion. It would have gotten stuck on the inside side of it, never would have been able to get out without, you know, cutting down the the masts a bunch. So I, I just always love this. As I said, I was born and raised in Seattle. And that's that's one that I particularly like to highlight. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we can also use other names. We can we can add other names when the, the vessel has changed its name several times, once or more times. We can put those under the specific name that we have here as well. 